So I, I'm so excited to talk to you, man. I'm such a fan of, of music and you've been a part of very different music genres way over the decades. And before we get yeah. into your new single and your upcoming album, here at Bionic Buzz, we're all about people's passion. I want to know where your passion for music came from, led you on this amazing journey from you know, being in the band Chicago to Sons of Chaplin, your solo career. Was it a certain album, a certain live performance, or something that was natural for you growing up in Oakland, California? Well, I grew up, I mean, I was, I grew up in Oakland up until I was about five and a half. Up to that point, my mom was a, a little bit, a little bit around the band, you know, a bit of a hard drinker, you know what I mean? But she wrote a lot of stuff. She's a good piano player. Mm-hmm. And she would put me in the, in the playpen and run it, push it under the piano and just, you know, work on songs all for hours, you know, and I'd just be cruising, just say, Hey, whatever this is, is great. So, I mean, I, I was kind of, it was kind of a foregone conclusion at the get. And then I had piano lessons when I was four. Okay. And then my parents got divorced when I was five and a half. And I kind of decided I wanted to either be a cowboy or a fireman or something, you know, <laughs> I, would think, I think I'll just go for being a regular kid for a little while and just kind of keep it, keep it easy. Mm-hmm. And then I kind of discovered guitar and, and, and one thing led to another. The next thing, you know, we're, we're, you know, we lived in Santa Barbara for a while and then we moved up to, uh, to uh, uh, Marin County and in California. Okay. And uh, that's that's when things started to really happen. I started to really get into bands and start to really make noise and stuff like that. And we had a band in high school called The Opposite Six, which was really fun. We had a couple of horns, uh, both, you know, reeds, tenor, tenor and baritone. And, uh, and we just had a ball doing that. And then that when it worked into the Sons of Champlin and really that kind of carried me for, you know, 13 years or something. Yeah. Now, you know, the, the and that was when I when I kind of learned how to write and how to how to you know record. Oh, gotcha. And that kind of thing, yeah. And correct me if I'm wrong. The Sons of Champlin were they from like the Bay Area part of that whole '60s '70s famous music oh, scene? Yeah. You know. Yeah, we were we were Fillmore babies, Fillmore and Avalon ballroom babies. This was kind of where we, you know, it was when we we just we were kind of part of. It might have been the 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 tale of the the uh, San Francisco music thing a lot of the bands that were happening in san francisco were really started off as skiffle bands and they were they kind of came out of the folk scene we came out of listening to james brown and the famous flames <laughs> so our scene was a little bit different but i i had i had uh, we had writing wise we had really started to write some kind of really singular singular stuff for us that was really cool plus we had a guitar player that was tearing it up like big time People. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I'm very fascinated with music history and especially music stories. Is, there, is anything from that time period, like did you cross paths with like the Grateful Dead or Janis Joplin? Or- oh, yeah. I mean, I know all those guys. My my older son, who's passed away a couple of years ago, but when he was when he was a baby, we were playing. A, it was a benefit at the Fillmore for The Matrix, which was a, even a smaller club. And it's right after uh, Monterey Pop and Janis was on her way. You know, she's oh. definitely on her way. So I was there and, and uh, you know, the baby was with us. We were up in the back room, a small back room that all the band shared. And at some point in the game, uh, my wife was gonna watch the band through this little window. And Janice says, I'll take care of the kid. Go ahead and watch your band. You know, watch your husband's, you know, go check your old man's band out. Aww. So Brad's first babysitter was Janis Joplin. You know? <laughs> I, hopefully he didn't, hopefully she didn't do the old WC Fields routine and put wild turkey in his milk bottle <laughs> hey that that might that may, that may that might explain help with tv you, you never know yeah, <laughs> could have been long. yeah so i mean yeah i've known all these guys not real close i don't you yeah. didn't hang seriously i mean we pretty much stayed in our own little world well you've had a fast city career i'm gonna throw some stats out for people who don't know i mean uh, so we talked about you the time period in the 60s 70s and then uh 70s 80s you moved down to los angeles you were kind yeah. of a section a session vocalist musician you worked with elton john neil diamond kenny rogers and then you won two grammys uh one for co-writing after the love is gone which i guess earth wind and fire end up recording exactly and then another one for co-writing turn your love around that you co-wrote with george benson for his song we co-wrote for george benson it was oh, me for george benson. Nice. yeah it was me and jay Graydon. Uh, and Steve Lukather wrote that together. Oh wow! Luke, and you also had a- I mean, all three of us were guitar players. I mean, I'm, I call, I call myself a guitar player. Around those guys, I don't pick up a guitar, you know. What I mean? <laughs> but I play the guitar, you know. And so all three of these guitar players were writing a song for this, the world's best guitar player to sing. So it, we were kind of knocked out to be able to do that. It was great. Uh, and George, George is a sweetie pie. He's a really, really nice guy. 
great guy. Sings and plays his butt off. I mean, he's ridiculous, you know? One of, the, one, of the, one of the top, I think probably to this day, maybe the number one top bebop guitar player on the earth. I mean, he Oh, really, absolutely, yeah. Oh, he's serious business there. We're not fooling around at all. Anyway. So yeah, you ended up joining the band Chicago. Uh, kind of same thing. Is there any fun stories from like that time period in LA in the 80s, you know? like. Well, yeah, I mean, we were just, at some point of the game, we just caught a, we caught a, we, I, I, a friend of mine says, hey man, that solo caught some air, you know? We got we got into it. And and I kind of moved to LA right when it was just starting to explode. Yeah. And, and what the, what Japan and Sweden and Norway and Denmark, they call it West Coast music. Oh. And I was at kind of ground zero for a lot of the West Coast music. I was working with Lee Rittenauer on a lot of things. So that kind of got me noticed in Japan and, and, and around the world. And uh, uh, and Lee made some great records. I sang a, a, sang a lead on a Stevie Wonder song on one and Lee's, I think it might've been his first solo album, uh, Captain Fingers album. Oh. And I sang a song, Isn't She Lovely on it with a, it's a David Foster arrangement and uh, uh, Mike and Jeff Procaro played on it. Wow, that's a great uh, Foster, song. <laughs> Foster played on uh, it, of course, played on it. And, uh, and uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Ray Parker Jr. played rhythm. Smoking track. Wow. You know, in your face, that smoking track. And Foster kind of turned me. And so, I mean, I, I was really kind of close friends with David Foster mm -hmm. and Jay Graydon when I moved to town. And they were doing, they were doing uh, uh, basics dates for a lot of people. And at one point they were going, hey, if you get when you get around to doing background vocals on this thing that we just did for you, call this guy. So they kind of both those guys kind of got me my first my first dates in uh, in uh, in Los Angeles. And then I think the work I did got me my second and third and fourth, et cetera. Kind of and yeah. After a while, it just kind of snowballed. And, you know, and then and then the groups that I was working with, I had did a, a lot of stuff with Carmen Twilly and Nettie and Vanette Gloud. Uh, was a trio that we did on a lot of R&B records and you know, disco records and stuff like that. And then at one point, me and Bobby Kimball and Michael McDonald were going around doing background dates around town. And then Michael got busy. And at some point, Bobby actually got busy. We started doing working with Tom Kelly, who's turned out to be one of the one of the biggest writers ever, you know. Yeah. And uh, but a great singer and a really good friend, a fun guy to hang with. And. Uh, and uh, and actually, then Richard Page hit town, so I started working with Richard, and you know, so I just kind of kept the rent paid while I was waiting to do the next solo album, kind of thing. Oh, so, and I wasn't planning on becoming a vocal arranger, but it turns out that's what ended up happening. You know, kind of <laughs> section leader on a lot of these dates. So, it's well, it worked I, out really well, actually. <laughs> yeah, it really kind of. I mean, I just sort of landed at the right time, in the right place. Not how my career usually goes. I always say with with the Sons, with my first band. I mean, you know, every time opportunity knocked, we answered the phone. You know. Yeah. We just kind of missed missed a lot of a lot of opportunities because we were probably smoking too much weed. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're young in that time period, I guess, you know. So. Yeah, it was all part of the part of the thing at that time. A lot of people did it and and didn't let it get in their way. We did it and believed in it. They thought, oh, this is what this is what we do. No, you do music in spite of this, really is kind of how it worked out. Anyway, neither here nor there. Uh, it's I've just kind of gotten used to the way my career's gone. I've just really kind of gotten used to really being busy you know, doing a lot of things. And, and it's, uh, it seems to be what keeps me going. I mean, I've yeah. been doing it this long, and I'm still doing it. And now this now this kind of leads up to this new album and Absolutely. this new album. This thing is, is got a lot of what's what this is all about. I'm trying to try to put every coalesce as it were to put everything together. And you know, I had a I had a couple of years there it was pretty bad. I lost my my older son passed away. Oh, the day after I was diagnosed with uh, aggressive uh, prostate cancer. Oh, so so it, it was a good week. And so, I mean, at some point in the game, I kind of realized my the list of things I care about got shorter. The list of mm -hmm. things I don't care about got quite a bit longer. And uh, and music was at the top of the list yeah. of things that I care about. So I, I kind of, with this album, I kind of went, I, I want to try to do this a little differently than just a good craft album. Okay. 
Well, let's talk about the album. You, you released the first single, Reason to Believe, uh, January 1st. A great way to start the new year. I mean, uh, yeah. I love the song. I mean, the lyrics got my heart in your hand. You're my reason to believe. So powerful. Mm -hmm. It was I'll really kind of about gratitude. I didn't even realize it when I was writing it, but it was sort of gratitude. For In my case, it was kind of gratitude for for Tamara getting me through those. There was a bad, really a bad year there. And I really, I kind of needed help, you know, and usually I'm, I don't need help. I could do it myself. Well, I couldn't, you know, and she really helped me through it, kept me laughing, kept me grooving. Uh, it kept me musical during a really funny time. It's when you when you go to scratch your head and your hand comes back and it just looks like a mitten, you know the yeah. shit's in the fan. Yeah. Yeah. Things, are, things are a little shaky at this point. So, so when I mean, did you she, start writing that song and the other songs for the upcoming well, album? Well, I, I had kind of gotten to the point where, you know, I mean, I, I we had just done a, an album a couple of years before with Gary Falcone, uh, me and Tamara and Gary called Wonderground. And uh, and that wasn't really catching air, but we had we had some material that we were kind of using, we were figuring on maybe a second album with those guys. And Tamara finally said, Bill, enough of this. You know, do a solo album. You're you're really due for it. It's been 10 years. You know, you've gone through enough. You've, you know, she walked in when I was when I just had a guitar and was writing uh the title, what's the title song of the album, Living for Love. Mm -hmm. And that's when she said, it's your time. You got to go for it. You're really on a roll. Hit, hit, jump in, make this happen. So I mean, I kept a few of the songs that we had done that we had planned on for Wonderground, and uh, and I just kind of shushed them up, put them kind of more in my ballpark, and uh, and then I wrote a whole bunch of other new stuff. I got Greg Matheson involved, and man, we got three songs on there. They're funkier than a three day old three day old band aid, you know. <laughs> And Matheson, uh, Greg's one of the all-time greats, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, whenever we write together, we come out with some pretty cool stuff. And then we got the people that we got to uh, to play on the record to help us out on this handful of really great soloists. We got Mark Russo on a little bit of sax. Not a lot of horns on the record, but the ones that are there is all Mark. Probably, probably the funky um, songs, probably. Oh man, he's he's good. He was with uh, Yellow Jackets originally. It was original. Oh wow. Thing. And he's been playing with Doobie Brothers for years. He just, Dang. you know, whenever they need a horn solo, he comes out and just tears it up, you know. <laughs> he played with the Suns for a little while. And he's just an old, a dear friend. And, you know, we couldn't really put big sessions together with horns. So I had him on one of Greg's tunes, especially me, I had him stack saxes. So it was Barry, Barry, one Barry, two tenors, two altos. And uh, man, powerful. I love and that. Then, and he played an alto solo on another tune. It's like, oh man, forget about it. This guy's ridiculous. So, and I had Lenny Castro playing percussion on the whole record. I just handed him the drive and said, have your way with it. You know what I mean? He's just amazing, amazing group. And I got, you know, on reason to believe what really got me is uh, uh, Bruce Geich, an old dear co-writer and friend of ours uh, lives in Nashville. And he, he sent us this track that he had had or sitting around for you know, maybe four or five years. I don't even know how long, but it had George Hawkins Jr. on bass. And George has been, I've had at least one George song on every record I've done. Oh, wow. And, and George passed away a couple of years ago. He had lymphoma and it just took him out. And, uh, and uh, so I was just, I was just crying. I was going, man, we got a George Hawkins tune on it. On that particular track, Vin, uh, Vinnie Colliuta played drums on it. And, uh, and then Bruce played everything else. All and typically the, his guitar playing is always ridiculously great, and uh, he just plays the right. Th as, as a writer, he plays the right thing at the right time. He's just a, a great keyboard player. I put some Hammond B three on it. We put a bunch of vocals. I mean, when Tamara and I heard the just the MP three of a rough, we were like, oh, well, where's the where's the legal pad? Where's the pencils? Let's go. We we got yeah, on that. Yeah, especially right Joy. Away. What do you call that? Is that background vocals, gang vocals? I especially yeah. Joy in that song, Reason to Believe. You know. Yeah, backgrounds are are fat. They're big. I mean, that, that's okay. kind of what. It's what's cool is when I whenever I do a record, even if it's just solo record, I don't have to bring in a lot of people to do a lot of stuff. I can do it myself. Mm -hmm. And in this house, I mean, we got me and Tamara always there for, for vocals and uh, and we need any other stuff. My son, Will, is an amazing, he's a Berkeley grad. He's, a, he's an amazing piano player, bass player, drummer, programmer, writer, singer, you name it, he does it, mm -hmm. you know. So it's, if I'm in need of anything from him, there he is, you know. So it's been really kind of cool, uh, you know. I mean, our house. I mean, it's all ears in our house, including our dogs. We got a pappy on with those really big ears. It's like <laughs> I want the studio. No, I want the studio. <laughs> it's like that. 
Oh, I love it. Well, your album comes out uh, it's called Living for Love, uh, January 22nd uh, from yeah. Imagine Records. And you can actually go to your website. You can pre-order it, and you can actually get one that's signed. And we're all talk- yeah. all here about staying safe during this pandemic. You can also go get uh, masks from um, SOC up there, which is pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sons of Champlin masks. I mean, it's just our kind of our merch shop. So it's BillChamplin.com. Mm-hmm forward slash shop and that album is available there we've got about i don't know a couple of hundred two three hundred uh pre-orders and we're getting the cds tomorrow so there's going to be some envelope stuffing pretty quick <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of you have to try to get some kind of uh some kind of thing going uh an assembly line. Work. <laughs> yeah right <laughs> what are you doing tomorrow stuffing envelopes going to the going to the post office you know but uh, it's really, really cool. I mean, uh, you know, Imagine wasn't all that interested in putting out a CD. They just wanted to really do worldwide pretty much. Yeah. Well, it's kind of nice that everything can be all digital now because you don't have to worry about going yeah. to the CD shop yeah. right now. But I mean, a lot. I know a lot of the people that, that like my music oh, yeah. and have over the years are real, real fans of CDs. <laughs> somebody was, uh, I was talking to somebody on telephone the other day. He said, well, I was talking with Alice Cooper. He said, I don't really like buying air. <laughs> so alice i've worked with him before he's a he's a cool cool guy man what a funny guy i don't really like buying air if i'm gonna spend money i want something i can hold my hand you know so there's there are people that are kind of like that made a comeback you know people like collecting those you know yeah i hear you hey you know i mean uh, and then we're looking you know i mean we're not planning it at the moment because we got a lot of stuff to do at this point but we're looking at maybe trying to release this as an lp at some point in the game because oh, awesome. a lot of people really like that very nice. Uh, how you, you know, doing health wise? Everything good or? I'm good. I put a lot of that stuff in the rear view mirror, which was uh-huh. really, really cool. And uh, 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 I'm, I'm doing fine. Everything's, everything's good. That's good. Uh, I wish I could get out more, but that's just the nature of this, this pandemic. Where are you located? Uh, I just moved from LA area to Orlando, actually. So. So you're in Orlando then. Yeah. So you yeah. you guys can get out and about. I mean, LA yeah. is locked down tight. There's no. Oh, absolutely. I mean, at least they had you could you know like uh, restaurants would, they spent a lot of money putting it together so you could go eat outdoors, and then the uh, then the governor just shut that down. So I mean, oh it's, yeah, it's pretty nasty. Everything is closed. You know, certain. Although you can go to a strip bar. <laughs> <laughs> You can't go to church, but you can go to a strip bar. I just, I don't quite understand where all of that's coming from, but I, yeah, it's not, for, it's not for me to understand anything. You know, yeah. I, I just, the more, I, the, the more older I get, the more I realize I'm a one trick pony. I do this thing that I do. That's all I do. Yeah. And I'll do the dish and I can do the dishes. So there you go. <laughs> I got my, I got my gig around the house. I'm covered. And, uh, and, I'm, but this, this music is, uh, you know, I, for anybody who's heard my stuff, it's, they've all been it's really good records. It's all been really cool. Nobody mixed it like Alan. Alan tore wow. it up, and he was he was the drummer on half the half the songs. Alan Hurts, mm-hmm. great mixer, and we took it to a a legendary uh, mastering engineer, uh, 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 legendary, and I forgot his name. It's Joe, uh, uh, oh man, what's wrong with me? Anyway, he yeah. does a, does the dead stuff. He's remastered a lot of Hendrix stuff. Oh and, wow! Uh, yeah, he's he's a bad yeah. boy. I mean, when I walked in, Joe said, uh, "If you don't mind, I'm gonna throw this to. I got an old, beautiful, you know, half inch quarter track or half track machine. I'm gonna throw this stuff to tape and master it there." <laughs> and I went, "Now nah, we're talking. You know, <laughs> the, the more analog you can get, the warmer the record's gonna be." Oh yeah, absolutely. You know. So that's one of the reasons why between Allen's and uh, and joe it's a uh, gasward joe gasward i'm sorry joe if you hear this you can shoot me the next time you see me it's joe gasward is the uh is the uh, uh mastering engineer and man he he this thing came out just sounded warm and rich and full and it's like a like a lp used to sound so i mean it's, it's you, you know people so- can say old school but it's it's yeah well, it's you, going so straight you, kinda, you worked with different musicians from Nashville around the country digitally, but then you were able to put that stuff on the analog track and then get that warm feel out of yeah, it. Yeah, well, I mean, we mixed it, you know, we mixed it in Pro Tools and, okay. and Alan's got all kinds of outboard gear and, and compressors and yeah. and pre, you know, preamps and those kind of things that make certain things just sound fatter and bigger. And then uh, actually, he might have actually taken it and flown it to a, to a uh, he has a uh, four track 
I think an Ampex four track, oh, yeah. great old piece of gear. And I think he flew some of it to that and flew it back. Wow. He did it once with a record and, and he had a, I think he had a Studer 24 track. He said, let's see what happens. It was one of Tamara's songs. Let's see what happens to the, to the sound files. Cause you look at the sound files, there are all these little jagged edges. Yeah. You fly it to tape and fly it back. And it looks like a warm little caterpillar. It just warms it up somehow, you know, it's, it's a compressor. It's just a compressor that demands four or five people to pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a little box. It's a full thing. But it, what it does to, to bass drum and what it does to, uh, to bass is just amazing. That's amazing. Well, thank yeah. you so much. You had an amazing career. I can't wait to hear the rest of the album when it drops January 20th. Thank you so much for having me. Just don't forget, uh, uh, you know, BillChamplin.com yes. forward slash shop. Mm -hmm. Uh, any plans for the rest of the year? Uh, maybe concert at some point, you know? Oh, I'd love to. It's not up to me. It's up to yeah. Sacramento, pretty yeah. much. You know, it's up to Washington and Sacramento. I mean, it was like whatever, you know, I mean, I think they got a vaccine. I keep hearing yeah. a lot. Of, I, <laughs> I keep like hearing to get a lot one of, if you know where they're giving yeah. out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if but they're not, they'll never give it to me. I mean, there's no yeah. question about it. It's just, you have to be, I see it's looking like you have to be really in some special club to get this vaccine. So, I mean, there's a million of them out there. And I'm, I, I really think that nurses and doctors and, yeah. and people who work in hospitals, they really should be the first to get it. I mean, that just makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And that's probably what's going on at this point in the game. Yeah. So we've got to be patient. So, yeah. All right. Yeah, it's Bill, been, fun, been so a funny much. time, but I think that, you know, one thing about it that I really kind of thought, and I just kind of realized it is that they don't, you, nobody's allowed to touch. Yeah. That's a weird thing for human beings. That just oh, doesn't, very. that's a very weird thing. So I, I tried to make the music touchable. I tried to, you know, sing the lead vocals on a different day than I sang the background vocals, mm -hmm. you know, because that's the difference between craftsman background vocals and artist lead vocal. So I kind of made sure that I didn't just, make it a seventh track of backgrounds and you know i wanted to wanted to hop in and make sure that there was that there was a feel there was something that you a read believability in it so i mean it's a it's a really good album for that i mean i'm singing pretty good on this record yeah no so, it sounds great well cool. i tell all musicians all oh, this thank you for pretty releasing new music during this pandemic at least we have like some new art form to like keep our spirits up so i thank absolutely you and congratulations on the new album it's coming out january right. 22nd Thank you so much for having me. All right. Take Talk care, to you man. soon. Be good. Bye-bye.